everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at modern retellings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, ancient epics known for both brutal violence and instances of sexual assault. This episode is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverage and snack ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. Let us get into Silence of the Girls Part 1. Do you want to jump right in? Do you want to do a little synopsis? What do you want to do? A synopsis might be helpful because it's, again, like all of them, it's slightly different to everything else that we've covered before. So it's the Iliad from Briseis' perspective. Dun dun dun. Yes. But it doesn't start with the Iliad. No. Which I, I was caught off guard and I really appreciated it. I was I was reading it and I was like I because I've I listened to back when the book first came out the BBC did a like a I won't say truncated but there is a better word abridged abridged that's the one that's what we use when we do radio plays they did like an abridged um, version of it on BBC Radio Four which is my radio station of choice because I'm just that kind of middle class person <laughs> so I listened to it when the book first came out and loved it. But that was several years ago, and I didn't really remember a lot except that I really loved it. So reading the introduction, or like the opening chapters, it's this woman telling the story of an attack on a city and how she's been like corralled into the citadel and into this tower, essentially, with all the other women. And you know she's royal because of how she speaks. Mm. And I was kind of assuming it was Andromache. It's absolutely not Andromache and if you've re read the back of the book you know it's not Andromache because it says it's Briseis uh, <laughs> and then it, yeah I got to, I got to the part where she starts using personal names and I thought oh this is absolutely not Troy this is a raid on a different city and this is Briseis and not Andromache it threw me a curveball yeah because I mean I was expecting certain names and certain locations mm -hmm. to pop up and then also I was a little confused because when she was like Oh, yes, and my husband. And I'm like, wait, hu hu husband? Who? What? What is going on? Because, I mean, you never... You, I mean, I feel like when you talk about Briseis, because of where she comes in in the story, she's not given any sort of backstory, and you don't really know much other than she... Some representation, she's a priestess. Some, she's a princess. Some, she's not a princess, but someone connected to... You know, whatever representation you have, she she's always given something different, but that's all you know. And then basically the first time you really hear of her is, ah, she's claimed by Achilles. So, the fact that she was given a husband, and she's clearly royal, I was shocked. It was very interesting, yeah. And they gave her, like, a sister and brothers and stuff. Yeah! There's, there's a whole like, really rich backstory, and you get through the first half of the book, I found it clever because you get little bits of her life before but it's not told as kind of like a continuous now well so the story obviously is a continuous narrative but her reminiscences aren't they don't pick up and, and put down at the same place she sees something that like the one that springs to mind is when she's in the greek camp one of the um the greek military officers is wearing her father's tunic and this sparks in her mind this this remembrance because it was a tunic she had made for her father it sparks a remembrance of like where she was when she made it and a bit about her relationship with her father and then later on when she's we'll get to this later but someone puts a necklace on her it was her mother's necklace that her father had given her mother as a bride gift and it's just these little bits and pieces that remind her and the reader of her life prior to being a slave and it was very it's very well rounded and i think that's that's something that you definitely don't see in other Iliad adaptations is Briseis as like this whole character with a like a very full life. And the beginning goes into like issues that she's had with her mother-in-law and how she can't have children and how she felt about her husband and, and then the city falls and she's taken and 
is it Nestor? I can't remember when they get to, to the Greek camp, Nestor tells her, essentially forget everything that came before this. Mm -hmm. It will only make you yeah. miserable. And her internal response is, well, screw you. I'm going to remember everything I possibly can, uh, which is great because then as the reader, you get all of these remembrances as you read through. Yeah, no, I definitely loved, I mean, I, I think one thing that definitely stood out is from the beginning was, again, how tonally different this book is and what sets it apart from the other Iliad representations we've done. Because I think the pleasant surprise out of all the things we've done so far is that even though it's the same story over and over, which one would think we'd get tired of, I feel like every representation has picked one character to make them more well-rounded, give them a backstory. So it's it's almost like piecing together a bigger puzzle, right? Where it's like last time we, we looked at something that put Patroclus together as a whole person and he had personality and he wasn't just a sort of cursory character and this time it's Briseis. So I like how doing these different ones we're, we're learning more about them. And so, you know, I don't feel sort of as blasé, I guess, would be how I would put it about them. You know, before we did this, you know, I'd be like, if, if someone was like, yeah, tell me about Briseis and Patroclus, you know, I'd be like, I guess they're just two characters who really serve to make Achilles' story more interesting. You know, they don't really have anything else to them. Um, because they're not like full 3D people. I, I was I was definitely comparing the beginnings of both Song of Achilles, uh, Song of Achilles, and Sons of the Girls because to me the parallels are so strong. Which is they both start uh, in a non traditional setting without you know just starting exactly where the war starts. And I was like, well, in one you get Patroclus and Achilles before everything, and in this one you get Briseis and her life before. And I know it cuts pretty quickly to being captured and being a slave but that's one thing i did really appreciate and i love the parallels i did and i having like reading song of achilles directly before silence of the girls it's really interesting because the way patroclus and achilles are written in Sil in song of achilles is very much in line with what you see in silence of the girls achilles is a bit more of a like a, a bastard in silence of the girls but it's far enough along in the story of song of achilles that he's already kind of started this trajectory into arrogant bastard vil so having him be an arrogant bastard in silence of the girls is doesn't trip anything mentally for me and patroclus is just still an absolute sweetheart in both cases and um says to because briseis asks like why are you being so nice to me he like he brings her wine and he sits and kind of chats with her and he essentially says i know what it's like to be given to achilles as a plaything and she looks at him like i don't think you do and he explains actually yes he absolutely does again it, it fits in with what we've read in song of achilles it it's it's the same story. So I, I'm really enjoying this. It's like, it's like an extension. It is. And it's a really interesting extension because you're going from like the first one, Song of Achilles, is told from the male perspective. It's still humanizing to Patroclus and sort of to Achilles, as a, you know. But um, to go from like the male perspective right into now another feminist retelling, like it threw me for a curve, but it also doesn't because they're, they're similar enough. Um, it's, it's really funny because I feel like People are going to ask us, like, how did you choose your order? Did you do this on purpose? No, we didn't. If you're curious, no. What do we have time for this week? <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, if you're curious and you thought we would just stack our order so, you know, it was like one continuation. No, this was completely by chance, surprise, that we just decided the order in which. But um, I'm definitely pleased with kind of how things have gone because I feel like so many just kind of bleed into each other and we haven't just gone from one totally different thing to another thing that's like diametrically its opposite. Mm -hmm. When you're going through and analyzing the books, do you try to focus on like the book at hand or do you try to put it in context of like bigger picture of all of them that we've done? Because I've been noticing our, our like reading and analytical styles are, are very similar but also quite divergent because I feel like I've been inadvertently comparing all of them? I focus more on the book at hand and then when I'm done with that section and I'm thinking it over, like, little bits pop out to me that relate to previous books and, and movies. But no, mostly I, I'll, I'll try and focus on what I'm... It, it works well though, I feel like we have a good balance. It does, because you can point out the specifics of the given adaptation and I, I guess I'm just here like, fitting them all into the bigger puzzle. 
but this is interesting. Do you remember in in this thing where it was it, it was similar and yet different? Ah, yes, Lexi, good point. Yeah, you're just you know finding all the parallels. So <laughs> super interesting. I mean, okay, so in the early part, at least, you know. Was there one thing that stood out to you more than anything else that was like super big, super different, super similar? Um... I think, I think probably, especially for the books that we've been through and for some of the, the movie and TV stuff, this is, I would say, on the more gritty side of things. This is kind of more in the style of Troy Fall of a City than Brad Pitt's Troy. There's a lot more, like, the realities of war, it doesn't shy away from the fact that these women are slaves, they have no say in where they go and what they do, and actually, they're brutalised. And even when it's not sexual brutality, when Briseis is given over to Agamemnon, he, he assaults her. And then the rest of her time with him, she's either in the weaving tents and describing how they're not really allowed outside, they weave as long as it's light they get a brief break to eat and drink and that the air is so thick with like wool fibers floating around that it's like working in soup um and she describes that some of the women have health problems because they're just breathing in all these wool fibers all day and you're like things i did not think of at all and she describes um the washerwomen when they start laying out the bodies during the plague sequence, describing the washerwomen as being like up to their knees in human urine all day because the only way to get blood stains out of armor and clothing is to soak them in urine. And how these women just stink to everyone except themselves. And you think that's, again, absolutely, like you know logically that there are people doing this work and it was probably not pleasant work, but having someone actually go through and point it out and explain it to you was very interesting and I think that aspect that that very real everyday drudgery brutality is very different to what we've seen previously I did enjoy that she was eventually taken out of the weaving tents and put to work in the hospital tents Brissais describes it as being like the happiest time for her because she's doing something that that she actually enjoys and she feels has value. I think one of the notable things that stood out to me is that one quote, I mean, again, since I'm not reading it, I didn't like see this quoted, but so I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but um, from what I remember listening to, it's when she sort of sourly remarks the whole, um, like spread my legs for the man who killed my husband and, and brothers. And I was like, that is like a gritty sort of remark that, yeah, you just wouldn't get in, you know, a different adaptation. It's really interesting to read and Briseis like comments on it when she's talking about some of the other women who have been uh, taken as, as bed slaves by, by the men, a couple of them like seem to have fallen in love with their captors. And she says, I, I don't understand how this can happen because everyone I love is dead because of this one man who I'm now forced into bed with every single night. And that's something that, again, you don't really see, especially thinking of the the movie and the, the TV adaptations. The, like, Briseis is in Troy, she's kind of feisty and, like, fights back, but ultimately, yay Achilles. Maybe not yay Achilles, but I know I didn't get the sense that there was this that he was being held accountable. No, I mean, and comparing all three, I mean, you look at the Brad Pitt Troy movie and she goes, from, like, she doesn't like him. Yeah. You know, she calls him a dumb brute. And up until the moment that they actually have sex, like, she was there with a knife at his throat being like, Yeah, that's true. You know, it. this is payback. Mm -hmm. You know, you've killed so many people. If I don't kill you now, how many lives will I save? And he was like, well, I'm not afraid to die. Okay, do it. And then she can't. And then... Totally understand why they have to get to where they need to get to and, and all this stuff. But I just found it, you know, hilarious that in the movie, it goes from, I'm here with a knife and I'm going to kill you to he kisses her. And then she's like, okay. And then they have sex and then, then it's fine. Uh, and then you look at something like Fall of a City. And then again, it's not that sort of, I've fallen in love with you that you get in the movie. It's this like grudging respect that kind of turns into something more. Because the only thing you get really is like the 
the the threesome and it's not even like she was like yes i'm super excited it was like a uh, very organic like they're they're sitting on the beach they're doing their thing and it's like patrickless really kind of starts it and then he's you know you know lovey-dovey with achilles and then she kind of sees this and then so for, for me that was more like okay well they're already doing it and if they're inviting me in like fine all right let's have some fun let's that's interesting because i read that as habitual really yeah i didn't take that as being the first time that had happened oh well we only see once so i mean it is left up to interpretation we do we do interesting so you thought it would happen before but they mm. just chose to show yeah. once it already been in a okay yeah. yeah no for me it was a very sort of explorative moment and i thought that as a first time it was an interesting thing to bring to the screen if you're like how do we show that they have come to a place of just sort of grudging acceptance and respect mm -hmm. oh let's do this thing where she's okay with patroclus patroclus is like the glue between the three of them yeah so if he starts off something and they both love him then they're more likely to be like okay let's do it so. that's kind of a commonality i think across a lot of the adaptations is patroclus is this go between glue for briseis and achilles yeah no he really is like I, I i can't think necessarily of an adaptation i mean again troy movie aside and also discounting war goddess i can't think of anything where briseis and achilles come together of their own volition without having patroclus kind of as a buffer in the middle i mean i think that's also due to the movie didn't want to show anything sexual because you know they were just cousins platonic cousins but also I think it's important to keep in mind when these things are all made or written. And Troy 2004. Now, you know, do you remember where we were as a society in 2004? Were we super accepting of, like, gay things and threesomes? I wouldn't say we're massively accepting now, but I, I think we're a little better, maybe. Especially, yeah, with depictions in the media, definitely. Yeah, so I think it would have been less acceptable in 2004 to show... So I understand, like, why they couldn't really use him as the go-between, especially if they don't want to show anything remotely bi or gay. So, like, okay, fine. They had them sort of fall in love traditionally, whatever. But, you know, Fall of the City wasn't made until 18, 2018. That's much more contemporary. Sorry, this is a hard right. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on Achilles, his mother, and how Briseis plays into that whole messy situation. Because the, some of that was... Hmm, a little bit incestuous. Yes, I mean, well, one, the immediate thing that stood out was so different from what we were just doing, Song, Song of Achilles, right? Yeah, that is a huge difference. Because you're like, Thetis doesn't have, well, one, she doesn't really have a personality. So to the first thing we read that actually gives her personality, what we learned from the previous thing that we just looked at was she hates humanity. She doesn't like blah, blah, blah. So like from her opinion, if I were to think of, you know, if I'm just intercutting, you know, Briseis in Song of Achilles, the first thing that would go through my mind is, oh, human. So automatic hate, like Patroclus. This one, yeah, was so completely different. Honestly, I didn't know quite what to think other than I'm getting a lot of innuendo-y things. But I was, I was honestly trying as a whole to fit that into the context and be like, well, if it is innuendo we what is the purpose of this? Like, where would it fit in narrative-wise? Because it seems to me that the, the, the style in which the book is written is that there has to be a solid purpose. Like, Pat Barker clearly has, I don't want to say an agenda because that's not the right word, but, like, there's a, a specific way that she wants you to read this and what she wants you to take from it. And I would say it actually ties into... I think a larger, we haven't read the whole thing, but what I'm getting the early sense is going to turn into like a book long theme, which is agency. Like how much agency can the women have in the book, in the war? And, you know, being told from Briseis's perspective and from just what we've seen here early on, Briseis is struggling because she's trying to sort of create her own path and her own destiny but she has a severe lack of agency and all the women lack agency and so maybe it's 
because Zetis is not Trojan or something, but in a book that's filled with, it's a feminist retelling, but also a gritty one where you're talking about what power do they have in a situation where they have no agency. I think it would be quite weird to suddenly have Thetis have enough agency, if you know what I mean, to be able to make these decisions. So, I mean, obviously we don't know the rest of the book, so it could change, but I feel like if you were to put some innuendo in there, that gives them the agency that I don't think we're going to find in the rest of the book. So I'm like, okay, maybe it's innuendo, maybe it's not. Because I'm thinking about agency, I didn't really know how to read that in any other way other than, is this self-directed? Is this not? Is this something that Achilles is masterminding where he wants them to feel like they do? Yeah, from the lens of like, this is a book where clearly women don't have agency. It just strikes me as a bit not in line with what we're getting i don't know what do you think i think a lot of how achilles is being characterized here is as a like a giant man child it describes him like, throwing full-on tantrums and briseis says at, at one point she compares him to a child very regularly and then when you kind of get patroclus's explanation about oh his mother left when he was very young and he like cried himself to sleep every night and it, like it's clearly had a significant emotional effect on him and there's a lot of emotional stunting immaturity so i think i think what pat barker is trying to do and i, I think doing successfully is giving this sense of a child who had his primary parental figure just walk out on him one day and even though she comes back and visits they go from co-sleeping every night to she's just not there anymore and it like it doesn't he, i think he, she was seven maybe like, i can't remember exactly how old she says he was but he was an older child like that's a huge emotional disruption and if we think about Thetis generally, especially as we've seen in Song of Achilles, she's not exactly emotionally available herself. So I think I think there's an awful lot of like psychological stuff going on behind the scenes that is is hinted at and Briseis picks up as being like odd, but is never like explicitly discussed because it, it isn't something that the man really would or could discuss. I'm not saying that I think Pat Barker is insinuating there was an actual incestuous relationship between Achilles and Thetis. I think that because he was left at such a young age and because he he clearly doesn't feel valued by his mother, there's clearly something missing in that relationship because he goes out to the sea and like pleads with her and, and begs her to visit him was kind of the, the sense I was getting. Maybe projection then? Like a projecty type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's probably the best way I could describe it. So the the scene in, in particular that I'm thinking about for for people who haven't read the book, Briseis goes out to the ocean every day as like a like cleansing, cathartic ritual, a way to be out of the hellish situation she finds herself in. So she goes out to the sea and she comes back and usually does it. At a, like in the morning but one time she does it in the the late evening before she's called to achilles bedchamber so she goes to his bed with sea salt in her in her hair smelling of the ocean which obviously his mother is a sea goddess that's going to trigger some memories and his response is for me reading it was actually quite unsettling because she describes how he like grabs her and claws at her breasts and her hair and like latches on to her nipple and she said it wasn't it wasn't erotic it wasn't done in a way that a man would would make love to a woman it was done as a hungry baby it, like it, it's a primordial thing and it was really unsettling because there's this like mother child relationship thing being described but in the context of a slave woman being raped so it was uh, yeah I think I've said the word unsettling about five times in the past three minutes, but it was very unsettling for me to read. You don't think of Achilles as sort of being infantilized at all, but... It does, though. You're right. But it feels like he is, right? Like, but I mean, how infantilizing can you sort of get in the context of it's not a consensual... I mean, you know, it's never comfortable to read about rape or anything of the like, but... 
I mean, it adds a dimension, certainly, that it's not, like, just described as just being sort of a brutal rape. Like, the fact that she brings, like, this sort of nuanced thought about how it's happening to her, I found quite disturbingly interesting. It's Achilles as the sulking child that you kind of expect maybe going into it, but there's a psychological disturbance there, I think, that... I mean, boy needs therapy. He always needs therapy, but I feel like this version of Achilles needs a hell of a mo lot more therapy than, than is normal. Yeah, but I mean, let's be real. Everyone back then, they all needed therapy. We all still need therapy. We're just not, like... We all still need therapy. Not killing people to try and solve our problem. Well, most of us. I'm certainly not. Yeah. Eh, no, me neither. But, you know, every different adaptation we get and every different description of Achilles they're all sort of the same but all very different right where it's like it's all yeah he's got massive problems he's sort of a man child and all of them and you know that just based on the foundation of his character is he gets his his thing taken away and then he salts like a five-year-old but yeah I mean it's interesting how you can add layers to each version but also you know the the various ages that he's being portrayed in all the different adaptations whether it's intentional or not i mean you know how old do we think the achilles is when he's being played by brad pitt or david Giazzi in fall of the city he definitely doesn't seem like a little teenager to me you know he's like fully formed adult which is so different from these other adaptations where you're like no he's like a child <laughs> or like a bratty teenager you know whatever but i don't know i just i feel like it changes how we perceive what's going on based on like how he's being portrayed like what age he's being portrayed because they don't say explicitly that he's older in some of these adaptations i think you're just left to assume which i get for like media purposes especially for the, the movie and stuff but i think it really does affect how we perceive it you know i i don't know when, when i see brad pitt playing him I would never in a million years just be like, oh yeah, and he's a teenager. Like, it just, if it doesn't occur to me, and I and I know the original, I found it interesting that definitely it affects me based on what I'm reading or seeing. Because as a classicist, I'm very familiar with the material, and I know a lot more than just your normal person who's an enthusiast. And I'm always a bit shocked by how much I get sucked into... Like, perceptions, right? Like, I'm a classicist. I should know how old he is. I should know the story. And yet, I watch Brad Pitt, and I'm like, yes, you are this, like, delicious 30-year-old man. You know? And I'm like, no, stop, stop. Young, young boy. Yeah. Like, bratty teenager. Um, which is funny, then, because Brad Pitt does actually excellently pull off the whole sulking thing. And I'm seeing him sulk as an adult and not a child. And I'm like, it still works. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, does it affect you as much as it affects me the perception of his age not so much i think because it's been so long since i read the iliad and because my classical education is was more intermixed with other like with egyptology and assyriology and so i, I have a smattering of it but it's not it wasn't a focus for me and i think also because the adaptations are they're all different enough from each other and from the source material that it's i don't find it terribly difficult to sit and treat each in my brain as a distinct story in and of itself which i think actually goes back to our different modes of of reading and reacting to what we're doing because yours as you said is is very much more holistic and mine is mm -hmm. i will read this story by itself as a story and then i'll think about how it relates to everything else yeah, I don't know. I just, I was kind of noticing that as a pattern. So I wanted to like bring that up and see if, you know, that was also what was contributing to our, our quite divergent ways of, of looking at things, which I think is great. It makes us, it makes us fully rounded. Yes. It's definitely more interesting from a discussion standpoint than us both treating it the same way. Hyper-focusing on the small details of just the, the works at hand. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's largely more indicative of my brain being weird, doing its thing, <laughs> liking bigger picture things which is hilarious because <laughs> sometimes my ADD is like no you're gonna hyper focus on this but for whatever reason 
Maybe it's because I had to go over the source material so many times mm-hmm. in undergrad. Like sometimes I, I, as I'm reading these things, I wonder, am I perceiving this because I, you know, had to read the Iliad and Odyssey like 10 different times over my five years of undergrad? Or is it because I read it so many different times? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, th- I, think it's, I think it's definitely playing into our different reactions because I've, I mean, I've, I've read them both a handful of times, but generally speaking, I've, I've read them as a whole. I feel like a lot of what you did in undergrad was focus on specific sections in much more detail. So different modes of reading. That's true. That's true. I mean, I had like a whole class just on ekphrasis. Honestly, it was a whole class just on that. And I was like, really? really? I mean, I didn't know there was that much to get into. And then I came out of this class and I was like, apparently there is this much to get into. This is amazing. No, it's super interesting. That was a long tangent. I didn't feel like there, are, I was I was going to ask about the, the plague sequence, but I'm not sure there's an awful lot that's different. It's interesting because it, you get it from Briseis' perspective and you kind of, she sees what's happening, I think, before most other people realize. And like you get the details of these rats just like, dying in the streets and exploding in blood which was yeah. delightful i mean it's yeah it's plague it, it's hard to basically do something vastly different when you're like it's plague <laughs> it's coming and it's killing people and at this point we know the result which is if you want to stop the plague give back the girl yeah one thing that, that was different for me about agamemnon and chryseis is he's not just refusing to give her back because she's his it's because he just likes her. So his sexual appetites are, are well documented in the book. And it makes a big deal about how like he has a favorite for like a week maybe and then just gives her to his men, which is a delightful fate for any anyone. And it it's surprising because Chryseis, he doesn't do that with. He just, he keeps her. And she's just staying there and he makes a big deal about how he prefers her to his wife. And it's very, very pleasant. It's not even that he's having to give a toy away, it's having to give back his favorite toy, his most favorite toy in the whole world, which was just a little difference and a little added dimension, I felt. For me, I guess it was like, okay, so it does make it more than just my spoil, my property. I, I guess it adds just to the, why is he so keen on taking Achilles? Yeah, spoil. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess when you read the original, you're like, okay, it's petty, so his property is gone, so it's just a vindictive, I'm taking Achilles' property, and you could read it that way. Or you could read it as, if I'm being forced to give up my favorite toy in the whole wide world, then... I'm taking one of yours, yeah. You should suffer. So it feels more personal than just property to property, right? So it does, I guess, I guess give it that more human dimension. There's only so much you can do, so I feel like Unless you're going to go completely wrath goddess and take it in your own direction, which is totally valid, and I would enjoy like something that's completely not even following the plot of the Iliad. But when you are kind of hemmed to the original source material, the original layout and, and everything, yeah, there's only so much you can do to sort of humanize them or, or give it a different dimension. So, I, I do think Pat Barker really captured the personal dislike between Achilles and Agamemnon. You hear Achilles railing against Agamemnon, and it's very clear that Agamemnon is deeply jealous of Achilles and finds him, feels threatened and challenged by his authority, or feels that his authority is threatened and challenged by Achilles and Achilles' presence. Um, I think that's, I mean, again, it's it's not a departure from what we expect, but I think it was well depicted. No, I agree. I definitely agree. We're about at the end of what we prepared and it's probably worth doing a a brief wrap up before we say goodbye for the week. I have to say, I'm really enjoying the book so far. Um, I like the Briseis. She's kind of, she's not really sarcastic in the way that Achilles in War Goddess is, is sarcastic, but she's hard and realistic and pragmatic, I think. Very pragmatic. What are you thinking? I like it so far as well. Um, the fact that tonally it's very different from everything mm-hmm. I'm, i was trying to think of like a, a something that was similar and the only thing that really came to my mind was thousand ships because that didn't shy away from some of the harder more gruesome details but even then i feel like some of the more graphic things that we're getting in this one you know we we would sort of skip over in ships yeah like you would know that it happened but it's not as graphic as it so yeah no i guess like fall of a city but like if fall of a city were in print 
form, mm-hmm. this would kind of be it. I enjoy these feminist retellings uh, a lot. I do. They're very interesting. By and large, very well done. Yeah, I didn't think that I would enjoy it as much as I have mm-hmm. been. They are all so different, even though they're using kind of the same lens. They're all focusing on different characters, different aspects of the story. And yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I don't know. For this one, as opposed to the other things we've done, I feel like I have to mentally prepare myself because I feel like we're going to get, like, I guess at the end of the war, assuming it goes that far, I feel like for stuff like when Troy actually falls and you get to the fate of the various people, I don't know why, but I feel like we're going to get a really graphic sort of retelling. I'm I'm almost a bit afraid to know. So what does happen to Astyanax? Like, are we going to get some graphic thing about how he's thrown off the walls? Are we going to get a not graphic? Like, like, it would be in line to get a very graphic sort of detail of what happens to all the women. So, you know, what we're getting right now is very much Iliad, Iliad. But just because it, it's concentrating on lack of agency and the more gruesome aspects from the women's perspective, I feel like the end could veer into a lot of, like, Euripides' Trojan women. Because nothing else seems like a a logical ending, right? Like, if it's feministic, but it's also talking about the horrors and lack of any agency for any of the females, and I'm like, just based on what we have, I'm like, there's no way that it would end with just... No, it's it's not going to be a happy ending. So I'm kind of like, oh, please don't be gruesome. Don't be sad. Don't make me cry. It probably will, but I'm like, please don't. I guess we're going to have to wait and see, really. It's going to be sad, but it'll be beautifully written, I think. So, if everyone else feels like reading a sad book, catch up and uh, join us next week for the rest of Silence of the Girls. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review, and you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week!